Right. So have you ever done something that you thought you got away with? Perhaps as a child, or if you are still a child, you've taken a piece of cake that you weren't supposed to take yet, or you've taken a piece of chocolate. You, you've taken it away, and mum is able to count, and there were 12 cakes, and now there's 11, and you're in trouble. You've got the icing all over your face. You thought you got away with it, but you hadn't. Perhaps as adults, we've done something we've thought we've got away with. We've been late for a meeting. Someone else was driving so slowly on the motorway, we had to go that bit faster. And then a few days later, we get a speeding ticket. Well, in a much more dreadful way, we see in this chapter uh, a man who thought he'd got away with it. He thought he'd got away with tricking God, no less, and yet he hadn't. He hadn't, as, uh, as Steve has so helpfully explained the context, Israel is ent- entering the land of Canaan and they've just defeated the city-state of Jericho. This is, J- Joshua chapter 7 is the high point of the Bible up to this point. Chronologically, this is the high point of the Bible. And in the next verse, so Joshua chapter 6, verse 27, it says this, The Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. This is a high point for Israel. But the next verse, The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the, the, some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. From a high to a low. This verse is perhaps one of the most dreadful verses in the entire Bible. It makes clear to us that Achan, who thought he would get away with this sin, who thought he could get away with it, the second he took of the devoted things, God knew. God knew exactly who he is, he knows his entire family tree, and he knows what he's done. And we see that this causes calamity, not just for him, not only for his family, but for the entirety of Israel. So, I've got four points. The first point I want us to see is defeat, verses 2 through 5. See, defeat. Something has gone wrong. Something is terribly, terribly wrong. Imagine yourself on that day as an Israelite. The normal clamour of the camp, the normal day-to-day noises of the camp have been replaced with the cries of anguish, with the screams the wails of the bereaved, the whimpering of the fatherless, the weeping of widows. You don't know what this fuss is about. What is going on? Why all this crying? Why all this wailing? Surely the men must be back by now from the battle at Ai. It was only a small town. Only a few people had to go out to fight it was going to be a pushover. No help needed with this one. What is the fuss about? Imagine as you hear the news, you hear, we have been defeated. We have been defeated. Men have died. In the battle of Jericho, no one was lost. Men have died in this battle. And you've got to ask yourself the question, how can this be? How could this be? God is with us. God is with us, how can this be? And your heart melts. You see there at the end of verse 5, the hearts of the people of Israel melted and became as water. You realise what this means. We have been defeated. God is not with us. Imagine Achan. Imagine the realisation dawning on his face as he hears the news. What has gone wrong? Achan is what's gone wrong. He has caused this trouble. He has caused this defeat. But in Achan's mind, it will be okay. The fuss will blow over in a few days. We'll go with a few more men and we'll defeat AI and we'll all forget about that. We had victory anyway. This is all going to go away. No one knows what I've done. No one saw my sin. No one knows. I'm going to get away with it, is what Achan says. Perhaps in some ways this is us here tonight. You're wondering, say, what is the fuss about Christianity? What is the fuss about Christianity, about this repenting, this turning away from sin? Why would I 
Why would I do that? Why would I admit that I've done something wrong? Why do I need to admit that I've got a problem? Why can't I live how I want six days a week and then come and look good on a Sunday? I put on the right clothes, I say the right things, and that makes me holy, doesn't it? No one knows what I do, no one knows what I say when I'm away from church, no one knows what I look at, no one knows what I think. Well, I want to challenge you tonight, if if you think no one knows, God knows. If you think no one knows, God knows. So we see the defeat of Israel caused by the sin of Achan. The next thing I want to see is the discovery, the discovery of Achan's sin. And again, this is a miraculous discovery. Joshua goes to God on his knees. The fuss is not going to go away. This is serious. Joshua falls on his face before God in prayer. Why does Joshua do that? Why is it important for Joshua to pray to God? Well, the first thing, Joshua knows God. Joshua has been blessed by God. Joshua has received promises from God, and so Joshua needs God to be with him. Joshua realises the fact that without God, he is without hope. Without God, there is no hope of defeating the, the cities in Canaan. There is no hope of taking the promised land. God needs to be with him. God needs to be with Israel. Joshua takes seriously being with God, and so he needs an answer to what has happened. Joshua needs to be close with God, and he has to ask, how can they be defeated if God is with them? Again, challenge for us. Is this us? When something goes wrong, do we seek God's face? Do we repent of sin? Do we draw close to God when we face trials and tribulations and difficulties? Is God the first port of call or do we try and fix it ourselves? Do we go to God or do we distance ourselves from him? Are we happy to go about our lives with no regard for God? If God were to leave you, how much of your life would you be able to get on with without him? If God takes his blessing away from you, how much of your life will be affected? Are we, like Joshua, would our entire existence fall apart without God or are we okay with just, oh, well, we'll just get another, something else to support that part of our life? If God is not with us, are we bereft or are we okay? Are we like Joshua? So Joshua falls on his face before God and he prays And then he gets this incredible response. This incredible response from verses 10 to 15. The Lord responds and he says this, Get up! Why have you fallen on your face? In other words, the Lord responds, Stop praying! Stop praying! Has God ever told that to you? Stop praying! Seems a strange thing for God to say, doesn't it? Stop praying. Why are you on your face? Well, God makes it clear, verse 11. Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Joshua needs to weed the sin out of Israel. No prayer is going to get rid of that sin. He needs to kill this sin. Why does he need to kill this sin? Verse 12, Therefore the people of Israel cannot stand to their enemies. They turn their back to their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Imagine hearing that as Joshua. Joshua who has been promised by God that, he, that God would be with him. And God says, I will be with you no more. 
Unless the devoted things are destroyed, God will be with Israel no more. Israel has become a thing for destruction, has become devoted for destruction. She must be made clean. So what must they do? Verse 13. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among among you. The people need to be made clean. That's what the word consecrate means. Needs to be made clean. Need to be clean. As Christians, again, is this us? Are we a clean people? It's not, do you shower, but is it, do you avoid sin? Are we holy? Do we live our lives in close communion with God? Do we act like Christ? Are we holy? You can't come to sin, God is, sorry, you can't come to God, God is telling us, God is, you can't come to God to repent while still holding on to your sin, holding out one hand for, for salvation from your difficulties while holding on with the other to sin. In my previous job, job I was uh, a climbing instructor, I did other activities, and on this one particular session I had a child and he wanted to go next. So what he did is he literally kicked his friend out of the way and went and stood by the wall because he wanted to go first. And I said, well, <laughs> I said to him, what are you doing? Why, why are you there? You're, it's not your turn yet. And he said, I will say sorry if I can go next. I can say sorry if I can go next. I will say sorry to God. I will repent of my sin as long as I can keep hold of it with the other hand. This is us, isn't it? This is us. We love our sin. We love our little pet sin that we keep hidden away. We don't get rid of sin, do we? We don't we must cast off our sin to be a clean people, to be a consecrated people. We must be holy. We must throw off all our sin. Do we pray to God for deliverance from sin while holding on to it at the same time? It's a child, yeah, caught in wrongdoing will say sorry, but not give the toy they've snatched back. Will not let the other person go first. Another illustration, an old pastor in America said that when he joined this church, he, he had this, this man who would come along to the prayer meeting and he would say this, Oh Lord, the spider of sin, the spider of sin has been weaving its web this week, has been weaving its web. And Lord, break the web, break the web of sin. This went on week after week. And uh, eventually the, the, the pastor, once he got used to this, he he, he yelled out in one of the prayer meetings, he said, No, Lord, no, Lord, don't break the web. Kill the spider. Kill the spider. You don't want the spider just to scurry back away to the corner to rear its ugly head again. You want to kill the spider, kill the sin dead. A famous theologian once said, Kill, kill sin or it is killing you. This is what this passage is showing us, isn't it? Israel needs to kill sin or it is going to kill them. They are devoted for destruction. So, Christians, is this us? Have we killed the spider? Have we killed sin? Or are we holding on to it with one hand, reaching out for salvation with the other? Have we killed the spider? The next thing we see is deception. We've seen the defeat of Israel caused by Achan. We have seen the discovery of Achan, and then I want to see the deception of Achan. Firstly, we see the decree go forth. I've already read some of it. Consecrate yourselves for, for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. 
and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by household, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. The decree goes forth. All of Israel hears it. Achan heard it. What is he going to do? What is he going to do? The Lord has made clear that he knows that one man has sinned. One man has caused the defeat. What is he going to do? What would you do? Let's think just quickly about Achan for a moment. Achan is in, the ch- is in Israel, is in the tribe of Judah. Achan has seen miracles with his own eyes. He has seen the manna and quail in the wilderness that have fed him. For years, he has seen the Lord moving before Israel with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He has seen water come from a rock twice. He has seen, or uh, no, he will have at least heard, perhaps have seen, of the ten plagues. He will have at least heard, perhaps seen again, the, the splitting of the Red Sea when Israel crossed through on dry ground and all the Egyptians were, sw- were washed away. He had been told the Ten Commandments. In the last few weeks alone, he had crossed over the Jordan on dry ground when it was in flood. And after it, God had instructed Israel to build a monument to the crossing so the future generations would see it and ask what it meant. And having built the monument, Joshua said this, He, that is God, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Those words were words that Achan had heard. God has done this. God has allowed Israel to miraculously enter the promised land so that all people in the world might know that he was strong, that his hand is powerful, and so that you, you Israelites, you Achan, you here today, by that you, so that you would fear the Lord your God forever. Days or hours before this chapter, the people of Israel had been granted a miraculous victory over Jericho, a victory that could only be put down to God. All of these things he had seen, or at, ve- or at the very least, heard seen all of these amazing works of God. He'd also heard warnings. Israel, of course, had gone their own way many times before. Israel had taken the golden, decided to build the golden calf as Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments. They decided that a lump of gold was better than the God that had taken them out of Israel. A lump of gold is better than God. He had heard the story of the floods. Of God judging the whole world for the sin of man. He had heard, of course, of the fall of man, even Eve taking the forbidden fruit and eating it. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, the sacrifices showing sin is serious. He was immersed in a culture that worshipped the living God. All of these standing as a warning for him. All of these standing as a reason to follow the miraculous God who had provided for Israel. And all of these standing as a reason not to leave him, and not to sin against him. Before he'd entered Jericho, he had heard these words. The city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for the destruction. The city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. But you, Israel, you, Achan... Keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. But in the midst of battle, Achan sees this plunder. He sees a fine robe. He sees silver and gold. In language pretty much identical to Genesis 3, he saw... He wanted, he took, and he hid. 
Eve saw, she desired, she took, and she hid. And look how that turned out. Adam and Eve, banished from the garden, cursed to work the ground, separated from the presence of God, cursed ultimately to die. You can hear him, as it were, echoing the devil. Did God really say to destroy all of the plunder? Destroy all of it? Look at it, it's so beautiful. All of it? No one will miss this little bit. Jericho's a rich, rich city. No one will notice this little bit of gold, this little robe. No one will know. It seems a shame to waste it. How is this going to turn out? Achan taken from the community of God's people. Israel separated from the presence of God. Achan is cursed to die. He was in the culture of Israel, but yet he didn't know God. He didn't know God. Achan was a rebellious man. He didn't believe God would or could do anything about his sin. God wouldn't do anything about his sin. God couldn't do anything about his sin in extreme defiance of everything he had ever learnt. This is just the golden calf all over again. This lump of gold is better than God's. He did not believe, ultimately, the promise of Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure. What stern words, what solemn words, of course. Be sure. Well, I want to say Achan was sure. Achan was definitely sure, but he was sure in the complete opposite direction. He was sure God didn't know, God had no power over him, he couldn't do anything now. Achan was going to get away with it. No one will know. No one will know. But God knows. God knows. Achan is deceived. Achan has deceived not just Israel, he's not just to try to deceive God, which has ultimately failed, he has managed to deceive himself that God cannot do anything about it. Anything about his sin, about his rebellion. Again, is this us, Christians? Is this us if you don't know God? Do we have a secret that no one knows about? No one could find out. Are we hiding the truth way down in our hearts? Well, the Bible is clear ultimately, isn't it? The Bible is clear that God knows. The Bible is clear that ultimately our sin that is in our heart that affects no one but ourselves, as we tell ourselves, that sin will affect us one day. That sin will affect us one day. There will be a day of judgment for all. And so, what must we do? Well, what is Achan going to do? When we come to the final point, we see death. So Achan hears the proclamation, he hears how one man is going to be taken from tribe and clan and household, man by man. He hears this decree that one man will be chosen. Tomorrow morning, one man is going to be chosen. And what's he going to do? What is going through his head? Well, surely... Surely we're crying out. Surely it's a, it's a no-brainer. You don't need to think about this one, do we? He must fling himself on the mercy of the Lord. He must. He must run to God. Does he know of God and his character, his character of forgiveness? Does he know that his God, that he has worshipped, the God that he has worshipped is a merciful God? Does he know that he needs to repent and God, well, the only thing he needs to do is repent and God will be pleased to show him mercy. Return to the Lord your God, you and your children, obey his voice in all that he commands you, with all your heart and with all your soul, and the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. Those were words spoken by Moses. Why has God waited for judgment? Why has no lightning bolt come out of the sky as Achan picked up the gold and the robe? Why, did he ha- why didn't he have a heart attack carrying the, the plunder back, back to his tents? Why? Because God is a merciful God. God has given him a chance to return to the Lord. God is a merciful God. 
Lord will have mercy if he will only repent, bring out the plunder, beg for forgiveness. But he doesn't know his God. He is deceived and he doesn't know his God. He doesn't know the character of God. He doesn't know the mercy that is offered to him. When a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves, thinking, I will be safe, even though I persist in going my own way, they will bring disaster on all the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them and the Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. The Lord will single them out from all the tribes of Israel for disaster, according to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law, says Moses. So those are the options. He can have mercy by repenting and flinging himself on God, or he can have disaster on himself because he says, I can continue going my own way and face no repercussions. <coughs> Achan doesn't know his God. He has managed to deceive himself, and so he remains stiff-necked and unrepentant, sure of himself. He knows he will go unnoticed. He's unwilling to confess his sin. He is unknowing of the mercy available to him. And so they gather the next morning, Achan and his family, his sons and his daughters, about a, in a massive throng of around about a million other families. He's got pretty good odds, hasn't he? One in a million. He's reassuring his wife, there's no way we'll get found out, darling. We're going to get away with this. We're okay. No one knows. No one saw me. The Achan's, Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, son of Zerah, of the son of Judah, is going to get away with it. The cry goes out from the casting of lots. Judah! Imagine his heart drop as he hears that cry. There is still a chance to repent. The Zerophites. Breathing is heavy, starting to panic. There is still a chance to repent. Zimri, beads of sweat are dripping off his brow. There is still a chance to repent. Kami, his wife stares at him, hugging their children to herself. There is still a chance to repent. Aiken! Aiken. Aiken. Be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. He's questioned and his conscience condemns him. He admits it, there's no point in denying it. And so. He and his wife, his sons, his daughters, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, the robe, the gold, the silver are taken to the valley and he hears these terrible words, words he was warned with just days before. Keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. Now Joshua says this, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. The Lord brings trouble on you today. This trouble is no small thing. It's not the sort of trouble you get into as a child. This is not just even just a bit of gold and silver and a robe. This was the Lord departing from Israel. Israel become, becoming a thing devoted to for destruction, 36 men dying. This is no small thing. The widows and the fatherless are looking on as Joshua says this. Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. You can, you can imagine it, can't you? His sons and his daughters clinging to him. Daddy, what is happening? Daddy, what has your sin done to us? Daddy, what have you done? What have you done? Brothers, this is, are we devoted to our sin? 
Do you love your sin more than God's? Do we love our sin more than life? Sin is like a, a cigarette packet. You, you perhaps you, you see them as you go around and you, you see the, the packet and it has a disgusting photo of someone who has is, is fallen victim to, to cancer because they have, they have smoked so much. And it says, smoking kills. The next time you get your pet sin out of your box that no one knows where it is apart from you, look at the side of it. See this picture. See this picture. All Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire. They stoned them with great stones. They raised over him a heap of stones that remains to this day. See on the side of your little box of sin, see that pile of stones. See what sin does. Sin kills, doesn't it? Have we killed sin or is sin killing us? Have we killed sin? Have we stomped on that spider? Have we killed sin or is sin killing us? Or is it devouring us from the inside like that cancer of the smoker? What must we learn from this chapter? Well, we must see that we are Achan in every single way. We must see that we are Achan. Achan was normal. Let's read his family tree again, verse 1. Achan, the evilest man in all Israel, man known for his wickedness, plotted to do evil. It's a bit of a new translation. No, it doesn't say that. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah. That's who Achan was. Achan did not come from a long line of thieves. Achan was normal. Achan is us. This story shows in all of our misery what we are like. We are all aching. We all have something hidden in our tent, don't we? We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are aching. All of us here today have sinned. And aching stands as a warning to us. All of us guilty of breaking God's law, disobeying his commands and doing evil. Each and every one of us. We have no excuse. We know what we have done, don't we? Our conscience, like Achan's, condemns us. But we think we can get away with it. You and I stand next to Achan on that day as the names are being called out. We are just as guilty as him. So what should we do? What should we do? We have the same opportunity as Achan. We need to make a decision. You must decide this day what you are devoted to. What are we devoted to? No matter who you are or what stage of life you're at, from the youngest to the oldest, what are we devoted to? Are you devoted to this world and all of its pleasures? A world doomed to destruction, a world corrupted by sin. Is that is that worth it to us? You have God in one hand, you have this world and all of its pleasures in the other. Are you devoted to money? Like Achan. Achan wanted money. That's all he wanted, just a bit of money, just a bit of gold. We devoted to money, money that you can't take with you in death. Are you devoted to your reputation? Where I'm never wrong. I wear the best clothes, I turn up to church 20 minutes early. I'm never wrong, I don't repent of things because I'm perfect. My reputation is staked on the fact that I'm perfect. Are you devoted, yes, to looking perfect, to being perfect in our religiousness, in our self-righteousness? Ultimately, all of those questions boil down to one thing. Are we devoted to things that are for destruction or are we devoted to God? We must be devoted to God, mustn't we? We must be devoted to God. We must turn from sin. We must repent. We must repent and go on repenting. Luther says this, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended the entire life of believers should be repentance, 
All of the Christian life is repentance, turning from sin and trusting in the good news that Jesus saves sinners isn't merely a one-time experience, but the daily substance of Christianity. Are our lives, is the substance of our lives repentance from sin? Are we turning from sin daily? Are we stomping on sin daily? Are we killing the spider daily? Or are we being killed by it? So what are we devoted to? What should you do if you have something hidden under your tent? If you've never come to God before to repent? You've got that thing that you hope no one ever knows about. The secret no one can discover or else it's all over. What should you do? What should you do if your secret has been found out? The terror you've been hiding from has become reality. Your life is in ruins. The court date is around the corner. The bailiffs are at the door. Your name is one name away from being called. What can you possibly do to save yourself? Well, we must do what Achan didn't. Each of us, whether we know Christ already or not, we must do what Achan didn't. We must turn from our sin, and we must fling ourselves on God's mercy. The only way out is to throw ourselves on him. We must call out to him for rescue. Each and every person here today must call on him for rescue. Cling to him, never let him go. You have an offer of salvation from the Lord of the universe himself. Chance to repent and turn to him. If we confess our sins, he, that is Jesus Christ, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. One man in this chapter, one man took on himself the punishment for his own sin. One man took on himself the punishment for the entire world we read about in the Gospels. For our sake, God, make Jesus sin for us. He made him who knew no sin, sin for us, so that we might have the righteousness of God. That is the offer that is for you today. You can have the righteousness in God in in return for the repentance and turning from sin. All you must do is repent, turn to him. Or the other option, we don't like that option, that sounds a little bit too hard. You can stand with Achan, stiff-necked, facing the coming wrath, head-on, refusing to repent, devoted to destruction. Oh, what a terrible thought. What a terrible, terrible thought. You must call out to Christ. He is the only one that can save you. He has given you mercy. You have had time to repent. Fall at his feet. Beg for repentance. Go there. Go there now. Go there now while there is still time. Break ranks with Achan. Do not stand with him. Run to Christ's side so that you may be made safe in him. You must be safe for the age to come. Repent and believe that Christ has died for your sins and through his death you can have eternal life with God. What are you devoted to?